that's well yeah and if you've got those relationships if you've built those relationships over time you know investors are, are going to feel more comfortable working with someone that they no one trust. Yeah. Um, even if that, if, even if it's on a slightly lower rate than they might be able to get elsewhere. Yeah. And it did take a little while to refinance that we had COVID in the middle and stuff. So we're not talking about timescales here, but the, once we were operational, the bank revalued it um, at 1.5 million. Can you please put your hands together and help me welcome to the stage Stuart Scott and Carly Houston. So uh, first of all, um, for people who, I know lots of people know you, but uh, for people who don't, Carly, would you like to tell a little bit of introduction about who you are, what you did before property maybe, and then, <laughs> and, and I know you've been doing property a long time now, but <laughs> quick, quick summary of a bit about your journey. Life before property, I don't think I can remember it. So everyone, I'm Carly Houston, so I know quite a few people in the room. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I, well, I did my first investment in 2009, but very, uh, very sort of um, half-heartedly and then did it, uh, went into full scale when I joined Mastermind in 2013. Prior to that, I was a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none, did very many different things. I was a chef at one point, I was a massage therapist, so didn't come from a corporate background or business background. And um, yeah, just, um, but... You know, my, I started with my sister in property properly in 2013 uh, when we joined Mastermind and really uh, that sort of catapulted us forward. And just going back to those early days, I know when you and Kirsten came and did Mastermind, um, you really didn't have any money to use to buy. So you were talking about using other people's money. Everything you did at first was joint ventures, wasn't it? Uh, well, no, we, well, we did start out doing both loans and joint ventures. Oh, okay, right, so, okay. so actually, our very first deal was a joint venture, but the yes. second one was loans. So we did a we did a combination of joint ventures and loans right yeah. from the start. But yeah, so we we didn't have any money um, when we started out. We sort of put the, the small amount of money we had into our education. Uh, so we knew actually right from the beginning that we had to work with other people's money. So you know I know that it's a thing that people struggle to get their head around and and sometimes well I think whatever position you're in think about that as a positive because because I kind of see the fact that we had no money as a positive because we then didn't have that experience of going well I've got this small pot of money and you know that sort of um you know that limited mindset of like well I've only got this small pot of money so um that I can only do these this one or two deals and then you've got to start thinking about uh, working with investors. Well, we had to do that from day one. So actually we saw it as a, a bit of a positive because that's the, the attitude that we came in with. Um, yeah, so uh, then our first deal was, was funded um, by my neighbor, uh, which some of you might know the story, and so I yeah. likes to tell that one. Um, and yeah, we went on from there through doing a mastermind, just uh, being able to tell people what we were doing, that we were educating ourselves. Um, and then we just built, it, uh, built our investor network over the yeah. months and years. And where, where did you meet those people that became some of your investors? Um, you? Obviously, one was your neighbor for yeah. the first one. So I think starting with people that you know is actually a really good yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Um, and you might think you don't know anybody, but when you start having those conversations, it's amazing you know, what, what comes back. So my neighbor's very first investor, a good friend of my sister's, he, he invested with us early on. Um, but then really we did start meeting people through networking so i think um our biggest investor actually met at a pin meeting uh, and that was just through offering offering to help him like you know he was starting out it was starting to interest in nature more so kirsty and i were we were we went to every pin meeting i mean when we were when we were on mastermind we were going to like six pin meetings a month yeah I think some people thought you were the pin meeting mascots. Yeah, yeah, we were. Because you were going to all of them, <laughs> you know. Scottish sisters. And uh, yeah, we sort of created this brand without meaning to. It's like, oh, you're Scottish sisters, aren't you? So we were just everywhere. And um, yeah, we lived, in, we lived in Brighton. So despite the fact that I was down the South Coast, um, we were going to all the London. So we were going up to all the London pin meetings. So four yeah. hour round trips. Like, so we were going every week. And it was just that of just getting out there. And the good thing about having that consistency of networking is that people you know, they can see that you're serious and that's yeah. you know and and that you're not what you're, you're it's that things. massive success formula is it? that consistency you know exactly. massive action time the right stuff times consistency exactly. and it's a bit like when you send if you send one landlord letter it may not even get to landlord but if you keep on sending that they're going to think you're a more serious person because you're just consistent right? yeah exactly we didn't sort of turn up one month and it not go for another couple of months it's like we're there every yeah. month um at, at these pin meetings um so yeah so in vet, uh, met 
uh, one of our biggest investors through through pin meeting and it actually we built that relationship over quite a few months before yeah. it became um be before he started investing with us and i'm again talking about that combination some some deals we did even with that single investor some deals are joint ventures some deals are loans yeah. so um we, yeah that'd be and just that. just for everyone's sake so so let's talk about the difference between a jv and like people yeah. often get confused so a joint venture is where you're effectively going into business with those people, aren't you? And, and there's a share of the cash flow and maybe a share of the equity. And, and often it's a 50-50. So you might have the deal and do the work. They put the money in and you share the proceeds 50-50. It doesn't have to be that, but that's often the way it happens. Whereas a loan is where someone lends you money, typically at a certain rate for a certain period of time, and they get their money back before you make any profit. And then once they've had their money back, they have no more interest in the property. So um, a lot of people, if they're using other people's money, they think they have to give away half of the deal. And it's maybe better to do that than have no deal. But you really, if you're doing just doing JVs at the moment, you really need to step up to the next level of just doing loans because a JV can be very worthwhile. And particularly if money needs leaving in a deal, it might be good to do that. But if it's where you can recycle and get all your money out, Doing a JV is quite an expensive way of doing it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you say, it's, it really depends on the deal. And, yes. and that's why I think we did the combination. I mean, so if you think all the deals that we've done with loans, um, actually, um, I mean, we had some of it was long term and it took a while to, to pay them back. But all of those have, um, you know, over the years, like we've maybe refinanced property a couple of times and they've all yeah. been uh, repaid. So then we've yeah. got all of the equity in that. And, you know, that will happen with the JV ones eventually over, over time. They'll get the money back and come yeah. up to another one. Um, yeah, but the but the if you're in a situation where it's still a great deal, but there's a big chunk of money left in, well, you might not want to. You might have already you might have used a loan for your last deal, yeah. and you might go, well, how many loans I want to have? You might yeah. not want to over leverage yourself. So yeah. by by doing a, a joint venture, and then there's money left in, you've not got that. Um, you've not got the thing of well, when am I going? How am I going to pay this yeah. money back? And and actually, so then it becomes about it doesn't. When I think about a deal, it's good. Like people say, oh, well, I can't do that because it's going to leave money in or or that property is too expensive. And I'm like, well, it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money the property needs, how expensive the property is. It just matters that it's a good deal yeah. and that it's giving good cash flow and good ROI. Because yeah. then then if you so if you have that and you, and you have a sort of attitude of abundance, then it's about, you know, because that money can come from someone who's happy to leave the money in long term so it absolutely has to be a great deal absolutely yeah but it could have you know we've we've done deals and we're in the southeast with expensive properties so my sister and i've done deals where there might be like over 100 grand left in maybe 150 grand left in but if that roi is like 60 percent and you're getting like mm. three four grand a month profit yeah. then actually it's fine. does yeah. that matter and you've got a jv mm. partner that's mm. happy to leave that money in for 10 years then yeah. you know that's a, a great deal and also one other thing that um i don't think you actually need a lot of investors because my son i know certainly your experience when you give the money back to someone they go oh uh do you want it back because they, they've got used to the interest haven't they, they? very so, rarely want their money back yeah yeah very i mean rarely. i've got the same so i've got investors with the same pot of cash that they put in nine years ago mm. yeah. you know because yeah. they because i'm like I can give you your money back now. No, no, please. No. <laughs> or they'll be like pointing me up. I'm sure. I'm always saying to sure it takes. Going, oh, I've just been offered another hundred grand. Or yeah. <laughs> so they like, come, um, you know, because the same people yeah. are. Oh, you know, once you build that it's trust, amazing how much money they find. Yes. <laughs> like yeah. I've got so many business. I've just found another fifty thousand. Is there yeah. anything you can do with that? And yeah, uh, yeah. it's quite, it's just, quite a regular text that comes up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes, just like, oh, not again. <laughs> they, they might have sold another property or sold some yeah. shares or whatever. You, you never know, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Brilliant. Exactly. Awesome. And, and and we'll talk about how you started working. Let's come to you for a minute, Stuart. So Stuart, you were a slightly different position. You were, because uh, you sold some businesses, you yep. had some funds and you were flipping properties at first yep. when, when we first met yep. and making good money doing that, but realized that you had to keep doing it to make the money. And then we persuaded you to start holding some of the properties. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'd make, talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, I, I had built and sold some design and uh, innovation companies and I had a pot of money to start with, but I did start working with investors very early. Yeah, because uh, obviously we talked and we said, actually, you're going to run out. It's great. You've got a pot of money, but you're going to run out pretty quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I started with working investors really quickly. I realized that I didn't have a, as soon as I stepped out from my company, I didn't have an income. Yeah. So although I'd flipped these buildings and generated these lump sums, I had no income. Yeah. I needed to replace my income. That's the number one priority. So we've got like a foundation. So, yeah, I started uh, building a portfolio and I realized very quickly it had to be HMOs. 
Mm. And that going back to when we first met, we could see there was an, uh, there was an opportunity to innovate in the HMO market yeah. for this new design-led, community-driven co-living. Yeah, so and, really and you were one of the real pioneers of that. I think, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, you were talking about that before. We were talking about having nice HMOs, but you came up with this, this co-living concept and really, you know, a, and many people might know Stuart for that. And obviously you teach yeah, so, yeah, through the co-living revolution. So the, um, I think I was just, the, I was in, the, I came from an innovation background and I was just in the right place at the right time. It yeah. would have happened anyway. Yeah. I was just in the right place at the right time to yeah. help disrupt the market a little bit there. And it's great to see that the standard of HMOs has dramatically improved anyway. Yeah. And, and that's great because I think HMOs, when people think about, they think about slum student properties and, and there are certainly ones like that out there, but that's obviously very different from what we teach, yeah. right? Well, actually, and, and, and funny enough, what happened at the same time as us doing co-living and trying to disrupt that market is going back all the way back there, we were trying to disrupt the hotel market. Yeah. Now, of course, we knew that there was legislation on the horizon for, for service accommodation but we're in a different world right now because it's being consulted. It's in government and yeah. that legislation is about to come in. So the difference is that apartment hotels really going back to 2016, I think, when we were delivering our first one, that was us looking at this looking. C1 model, guest yeah. houses, B&Bs, hotels, finding a new way to almost disrupt that traditional model and bring the learnings of service accommodation through in. Yeah. And so, of course, and we had our investors and it was a way of almost bringing investors into that, that journey of assets in central, central Brighton. And this is great, obviously, because, you know, you're both in the same area. Someone might say, well, if someone might really compete, but actually you, you recognised that it was getting harder to find good yeah. properties used as HMOs and thought, looked at the SA model, so the yeah. combination thought, let's do this. And obviously you came together and this is, what, I think, your first proper project together. While yeah. I was on Mastermind. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So Stuart and I had met just through yeah. sort of property networking and yeah. um, I suppose we should start working with investors. <laughs> yeah. So I started early, which is kind of like the tough love you do need early. Yeah. There's no point waiting until you need it. It's a lot easier to, to work with investors. Yeah. If Find you know, the money when you need it. It was, it was yeah. interesting, wasn't it? Because we kind of had that. Mm. So we'd come from those different um, uh, backgrounds and then, but I was like, you're going to run out. So like, yeah. and then that, that's kind of got you yeah. going. And of course, I, I wasn't really doing joint ventures. I was just working yeah. on a loan basis. You were doing a mixture of JVs and loans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and then we 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 kind of came, and we didn't jump into a JV. That's no, a really no, important so thing. We just got, kind of got to know each other over time. Sure, uh, I'd done masterminds um, a little bit before. Um, so you, we encouraged Stuart to go on masterminds and all that. And then um, it was after that we were like, well, actually, we'd got on really well, and like, well, we should do a project together. And yeah. Um, and and so that's when we um we were looking at well, what kind of projects at Brighton was quite tricky the HMO mm. market and Brighton's very competitive so you've obviously got article four everywhere yeah. and it was we were investing in areas outside of Brighton but although we were both investing in, in Brighton itself as well but it's like just the, the planning and all of that yeah. was such a pain because you've got because it takes months and months and um so anyway we were like okay well we could look at service accommodation because at that yeah it was sort of 2016-17 quite a lot of that Service accommodation then was very was the kind of buzz thing, and yeah. um, and we were like, well, this is really good, but we were actually thinking, surely this is going to get legislated at some point. Like, how are you? What's it's a bit like the Wild future? West, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Exactly. This, this is this is right now is like the HMO market before legislation, before planning, before yeah. PD, so before mid two thousands. Yeah, yeah. HMOs, it's a bit like SA yeah. at the moment, isn't it? SA now, and it's about to be regulated. Yeah. It's been regulated in Scotland. And it's yep. coming to England and Wales. Um, yep. And the problem is you don't quite know what it's going to be. Yep. But I think this is a way of future-proofing against that. because yep. So rather than having, you might have a, a normal house or an apartment, which is a C3 mm. residential planning mm. classification. When you look at B&Bs and hotels, they're a C1. C1. And yep. obviously local councils want to have Mm. accommodation short term mm. for people like this so so they're exactly. probably not going to change that whereas they might regulate against people who are using normal houses or flats for service exactly. accommodation so exactly. i think this is a re and that's one of the reasons i wanted you here to, to talk about that this is a, a a mega deal which i touched on earlier and we'll talk mm. a bit about tomorrow but also this is a deal that was funded using non way money so let's talk yep. about the deal. i'll let yep. you take that and you can drive through uh so talk, talk first of all, uh, so, that, so just sorry, back one, yep. um, you just see in the background, that's what the property was. 
Yeah. Right, so, so that's property no, that's, number two. That's, that's property that's number two. two. So that's our background. But well, that is what we did to it. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. we did to it. I was going to say, didn't, I thought it was different to that. Okay, no, the next, so next slide, just, that, so this is what yeah. we bought. This is, okay, this so, is property number one. This is it. So here's the thing. You think that we bought a rec and we converted it. We did not. Right. No, we bought. Nice. Was, you know, you can see from the photos there. So it wasn't a distressed property, but it no. was motivated sellers. Because what yes, they told us, well, they... do you know what? <laughs> they, um, well, yes, he had health problems. Yeah, he had um, health problems. And they were doing everything themselves. Yes. And uh, they were doing all the cleaning. Yeah. They never went on holiday because they had to do all the guests. He didn't understand he, he cost was, versus value. By the no, terms of it. He, was doing, he was cooking all the breakfasts. Yeah. They were living in the basement, which yeah. actually was quite damp. Yeah. And yeah. he had a lot of health problems. Yeah. And actually, they were yeah, they were just tired and fed up. Yeah. And we yeah. kind of approached them, and and they were like, yeah. oh, actually, off market, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, market. so we kind of got in touch with them, and they they hadn't actually. Well, what was the interesting thing actually, I think, was quite interesting is they hadn't put it on the market. They hadn't even necessarily been thinking about selling mm -hmm. until we got in touch with them. And mm -hmm. They were like, oh, actually. Yeah. Oh, maybe we'd quite like to sell because oh, maybe yeah. this is, and so then we start. But then we just built yeah. like a relationship with them over time, uh, and negotiated the yeah. the deal. So I mean, this, it doesn't look that bad, does it? No. So it doesn't actually look that bad. Great location. Now we're buying a C one building. Now yeah. normally, if you're doing a commercial conversion into a HMO, you'd have to go in and do your prior approvals and planning and all these other things you need to go to get planning. We were buying a C one building and not having to go into planning. No planning. We were buying a C1 building, but then we were adding value to the building. So let me show you the next one. So this was the, uh, this is the building here. So what you can't see, because the building is so tall, you can't actually see that there's a basement below the bottom and there's another loft level on the top. It's that yes, tall of building. Six, six uh, floors. Yeah. Six wow. floors. So I think we've got a floor plan. Okay, so we maximized the units. Okay, so we bought an existing C1 building. We maximized the units in those buildings without doing a single extension, okay? So we maximize the space. Think of the analogy of buying a three bed house and turning it to a six bed HMO. You're maximizing the space, mm -hmm. aren't you? You're going from three to six. So yeah, so they are maximizing the space. So they had, they were operating as eight units. So they were living there, doing breakfast. I think actually they were only operating as seven units seven because units. their son, son lived in yeah. one of the rooms. They lived in the basement. Their kitchen was on the ground floor. They had a breakfast room and all of that. So like um so basically we went from the, as an op as a business yeah. it was a business that was operating as eight seven or eight units and we increased that number to twelve units. And out of those units, most of those units can sleep couples, one to two people, but then two of the units can sleep four people. Okay, so we've got combinations, we've got suites, and we've got the uh, and we've got all of our kind of little micro studios, and all of the rooms have got levels of self-contained. So they have aspects of self-contained in there, a bit like studios, we would expect. But of course, we did all of that and we didn't have to do any planning because we didn't change a use class. So what, what was the kitchen became yeah. a unit? What was the dining room became a unit? Yeah. So, so you're, and, yeah. and no planning required for that, no minimum room sizes either. Like there's accommodation. Now, if you go and do that right now in residential, you've got to meet... The minimum national standards. Which, of course, for a one bed is 37 square 37, meters. Yeah. We don't have to stick to that because, of yeah. course, we're not creating residential. We're creating more units within a C1. Yeah. And these are obviously non-permanent residents. That's very important. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So there's yeah. 12 units you can see that we created on the on the floor plan there. We've maximized like the top floor and the ground and the basement is basically our suites. And then we've got a whole range of units uh, across the building. I know you want to see some pictures. I do. Yeah. So um, so this is uh, this is just an example of the kind of stuff we've done. Now, you probably recognize from the co-living revolution, there is certain aspects that we took through into creating this yeah. product. Um, but we took it further because we had a bit more budget to play with, didn't we? So we creatively we came up with the ideas with the up and over beds and all the bespoke stuff um, in the middle of the build, <laughs> in the middle of the build. We actually came up with the idea in the middle of the build. That, that's not a good idea, by the way. Don't write that down. You well, didn't want to think about it before you do it, but isn't that because that's where we're standing there and they'd, they'd sort of put the spacers on, and I was like, that's sure. I said, well, why don't we put that fake stuff in, in the middle of the thing? Yeah. That's, what, like, that's what happens when you get creators <laughs> building something. Yeah, we're both creators, <laughs> which can be dangerous. You've got to have a 10% contingency for what happens on, on, on the ground yeah. when you're coming out. So we had these, these, these are our kind of like some of our central units. Uh, a lot of them have kind of got bistro spaces in there. So if you want to sit down, relax, we kind of built them. Uh, a lot of them got sea views, haven't they? Yep. Got sea views, uh, well, sideways, not direct sea views. 
Um, and then, you know, they've got kitchenettes, uh, areas all the way out through the building. And we've got a range of stuff going from, uh, from smaller units and micro units all the way up to much larger units as well. Um, here's another example down on the ground floor. Again, you can see the kitchenette unit over on the right hand side. So and when you say kitchenette, what, what facilities are you talking about? Just microwave and... Uh, microwaves, sink? kettles, yeah. uh, toasters. Um, I mean, you, some of our units have full hobs. Right. But remember, that's dictated not by us, but by the fire brigade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've obviously got to meet all... I mean, everything's obviously building rigs compliant, yeah. and yeah. you've got to make sure you have all the fire rigs in there. And it's about what you can fit in as well, so... Yeah. You, there's but I guess there's a hotel, it's, it's got all that stuff in there anyway, already. Yeah. So, well, it's like a, yeah, so it's got more facilities more than, facilities, than, yeah. your, than a sort of average hotel room yes, because yeah. your average hotel room doesn't have, like, so we've got, yeah, so they've, you know, you've got like crockery in there and, and microwave yeah. and like, yeah. some of them have got hobs and sink yeah. and all of that. So we've taken the best so, bits of SA and we've transferred it into the C1 model. Yeah, got it's it. It's almost, we're using the use class. But you can, and then you can put different units within the same building. So mm. you might have a, you might have a, a larger unit that's got more facilities and then smaller yeah. units yeah. that have got yeah. less. So you've, you've got your catering to different types yeah. of guests. We've got well. one unit in the second apart hotel that sleeps up to six. And in fact, that could have slept more, but we've got a permanent, we've got a permanent lounge that you doesn't have to convert into beds at all. So it's really, really nice for nice. groups of friends. Mm -hmm. We've got people. like separate, it's got two separate bedrooms. We've got mm -hmm. one that's like a, got a double bed in it. And then you've got another room that's got like single beds in it, like yeah. four. Yeah. So someone so someone pulls, a, pulls a straw to get the private yeah. bed yeah, and everyone else has to sleep together. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can see here, it's just an example of some of the finishes we've done. Lots of lighting, uh, lots of layered lighting we put in there. Lots of bespoke design is in there. Um, and of course, you know, that all feeds through because, of course, similar to, to the world of HMOs, if you're going to put it on the market, the big difference between short stay and, and, lo and long stay is you're selling every night. Yeah. Hilton's got the same problem. They have to list things. They have to sell every night. They have to fill the, the Tuesdays, the Wednesdays, and the Thursdays. Mm -hmm. We all know that the Saturdays and Sundays will sell, but it's the midweeks. That's where you've got to have a great product. And, and out of interest, so obviously Brighton is, you know, a, a great kind of party town, really. It's great for summer. Is it mainly tourists? Are you having contractors as well? What kind of guests are you typically getting? What's the profile? Um, so, yeah, so you, so you, whatever, whatever location you're in, you need to do your research to find yeah. out who your guest profile is and who you're yeah. catering for. Uh, Brighton's predominantly leisure, yeah. predominant leisure market. You do get some corporate guests. So we do have, we do have yeah. corporate guests that stay with us. Um, but when you understand, if you do your research and understand your market, then that will dictate to some extent um how you how you what facilities you put in and maybe what size units you put in as well yeah, because yeah. because you could choose to have less units that are bigger yeah you know and that might be the right thing to do sometimes yeah. reducing the units might be the right thing to do um or d depending on who you're catering for you might have more units so and yeah. and also depending on what amenities and facilities are nearby that that can also dictate how you yeah. how you set it all up yeah. but yeah so yeah brighton's predominantly leisure we but... do get people in the middle of the night i mean you do get the classic thing where about two three <laughs> o'clock in the morning and they can't quite work out their code to get back in the front of the door and you know well, we don't have that problem, well, we don't have that problem no. but you know but no it's not us that deals with it they've, got, they've gone out <laughs> clubbing and they've come back in at two o'clock in the morning and they can't work out their code to get back in yeah. But, you know, that's going to happen in, in any city. We find town. that out the next day. That's yeah. But we've yeah. systemized all of that. All of the things that could have happened happened in the first year. We systemized and put processes in place to automate the entire business. Yeah. So but when we talk about numbers, I'd love to know at the end how much time you both spend in the business now. But we'll, we'll talk about when we've seen the figures. Okay. okay? Great. Uh, so, yes, this is what we've really done. We've taken the best bits of service accommodation, everything that we know of the market of service accommodation. And we've looked at the world of hotels, guest houses and B&Bs, C1 hotels. Yeah. And that's created apart hotels. Apart hotels aren't strictly residential apartments because otherwise we'd be doing buy to lets. We, yeah. we basically, you basically do an essay on top of a buy to let. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the that's the area that legislation is going to come closing down on. It's going to be all of the Airbnb and the, the buy to let market. Mm -hmm. So that you can see where it's, we've kind of taken those blendings from yeah. two worlds. Um, and really, this is what we've created. Do you want to go through some of this? Yeah. Yeah, we've not got a huge amount. So that's yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got them all on there so you guys can see it. So it's really a different kind of product. We've got that self-contained aspect in there. Uh, the digital door locks we built in. Yeah. Fully automated that. Yeah. So it's, it's really about just having that, the, the systems and processes in place to, to make the whole, um, well, the whole guest experience smooth, but yeah. also from an operational point of view, it's, yeah. it's having those systems and processes. And in then place. I guess coming back to your question, when these, 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 these processes that we put in place here, time-wise that we spend on this, 
per, per month and per week. But I don't know, we only, we only spend a few hours a, a week on it. Now. I mean, obviously, we did not we did put a lot of work in to, to get uh, it set up. Yeah. Yeah. But now but, you've done that Yeah, yeah. Once. Now it's systemized. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I'd say we'd, we spend more, no more than a day a week each on the business and very much at, maybe, you know, it could be less than that, but um, very much at a... A much more of a strategic yeah. and direct yeah. not, level not where we're no, actually because no. then we're, we're, no. we're getting involved in the parts that we like. So we yeah. we over we both oversee different yeah. different parts of the operations, but we're not doing any day to day. No, so we're, we're, not dealing, at, we're not dealing with guests. We're um, not dealing with. We might deal with improvements, uh, ideas, all, expansion, new sites, acquisitions. Yeah. Yeah. Strategic. But it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So this was the first one. I know you've got a, a, another one you've done as well. Yeah, like, so, but let, let's let's talk about the numbers here. Okay. Everyone wants to see numbers. <laughs> I do, yeah. All right. So we purchased this for for seven hundred seventy five thousand. Okay. We, um, we agreed that price with the the owner. You know, wasn't on the market or anything. So we mm -hmm. we sort of negotiated that price with them. It was actually valued at seven hundred twenty five right. when when we got the valuation done for the bank. Um, but actually, we talked about it, and we kind of knew what we were going to do with it, and they didn't mm. want to come down in price, so we we mm. we agreed to still pay them the seven hundred and seventy. So, like I said at the beginning, yeah. you got to work out, even if it's you're paying full price, yeah. that's okay if the deal works for you, and you know you can add value to mm. it. Exactly. And yeah. also, the yeah. bank still agreed to lend us the same amount they were; they just increased the loan to value, which oh, is right. interesting. Okay. So yeah, that just is on the side. Um, so the costs all in. So once we took into account the refurbishment and all the finance mm. costs, so the interest costs, invested interest, all everything, mm. uh, conveyancing and everything. So all in. So the purchase price plus all of those costs that came to a total cost of, of nine fifty. Yeah. Obviously, we start operating to you know, and that's up until the point that we start operating, as in when you can start to cover your costs and things. Um, we, you know, it, um, it did take a little while to refinance that we had COVID in the middle and stuff. So we're not talking about timescales here, but the once we were operational, the bank revalued it um, at 1.5 million. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, well, actually, that, that generate that equity line for us, though. Yeah. So that, that if you equity. imagine between that total spend and that that's all profit. That's like if we so we sold it tomorrow so at 1.5. But having said 1.5, that's the bank valuation, you know, at a time just after COVID, where they were sale, it probably sale for more like one point seven five or something like yeah, that. So yeah, so we we probably um, got, got from the bank's perspective half a million of equity, but in reality, if we sell yeah. three quarters of a million of equity, yeah, yeah. potentially, potentially, yeah, it is. Um, so then, uh, so that, so then we've got our our revenue, and then so we, you know, obviously revenue is one thing, but it's the the profit that's important, yeah, and because it's such a you've got to take on VAT because yeah, yep. so unlike so just be clear, I get this question all the time. So a normal rental property, an HMO single let, there is no VAT or zero rated, yeah. but this service accommodation, it, it's a it's a yeah. business, yeah. and if it's over eighty five k of revenue, then you have to charge VAT. Yeah, yes. exactly, and and mm. obviously the revenue is like hundreds of thousands, but I don't mm. know, three fifty thousand or something like that. And then um, then you've got your your VAT, you've got your commissions, you've got all your cost of yeah. sale, so everything commissions like that. to the online yeah, travel online agents, travel like, agents, yeah. bookings.com, Airbnb, yeah. those yeah. kind of things. Then yeah. you've got your cost of sale, like all yeah. your cleaning and everything like that. So you take all of that off and all your running costs. You're left with the operational profit, your sort of EBITDA, which we talk about the earnings before interest tax, amortization, mm. and depreciation. Yeah. And that gives you an operational profit, um, which is kind of how it's then valued as a business on that. Mm. Um, and then after the interest, so that's the sort of EBITDA figure, the operational mm. profit, then obviously we've got bank interest, a little bit of, well, I don't think we've got much invested interest now. Um, so then the, the profit after the, the interest is taken off, then that's 100,000. Yeah, so before corporation tax and all that. But so that's... you imagine how many buy to lets that would take you to get to that mm. amount mm. and how many HMOs, given that we're, you know, we're both HMO panels as well take a fair few hmos yeah. for us yeah. to, to get to the kind of revenue that that um now obviously you have to split that between you oh <laughs> so it's only 50 grand each for, for one day a week well, yeah. uh, well it was more than three quarters of a million of that we created that, that <laughs> yeah. kind of part of the yeah, part yeah, of the um yeah exactly the, so yeah uh, it's not bad G given that you obviously you know you you put lots of time and effort into yeah. it you added your skills that you had yeah. from your previous investing in um Still, that's a pretty good result, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's on one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the second one, um, 
you know, similar size, similar, 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 yeah. similar, so, yeah, similar numbers, numbers, which is awesome. Um, Fantastic. And, and I want to ask you about it because obviously I love it when I see uh, masterminds and the same from different groups getting mm. together and working together. Um, think back to when you started, before you started Mastermind Journey, did you ever think you'd be doing stuff like this? No, no. you probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, not hotels. No, 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 definitely not a party no, hotels. No, no, no. No. I mean, I, I kind of understood HMOs and vital lets, but, but I think that when we stumbled on C1 as a classification, we were like, yeah. Why has nobody noticed this yeah. yet? Yeah. I've obviously, you know, other, I'm sure other people, you know, other people have, have done it in the country. So I've actually bought a, a guest house, which I converted to an HMO and we talked about this before because we you know obviously guest houses make great HMOs mm. yeah but it's not that easy to get planning permission to yeah. change a guest house into an HMO yeah. especially if you're in a, a location like Brighton well, they where they will not yeah. let you uh, get planned they will not let you change something uh, within particular yeah. locations so it's quite tricky and and mm. so I know lots of people going I've got guest houses that make a brilliant HMO and it's like yeah well good luck with getting the planning mm. and but I've been through that and I did get the planning and it was, you know, and so but that was quite a, a lot of hassle. <laughs> but um, so when we were looking at this whole thing, mm. like, well, let's look at SA and we're like, well, what? And I think I had not long done this guest, not long ago done this guest. Mm. And it's like, actually, what about, we sort of like, well, what about like using the SA model, but doing it like fine, like with converting the guest house and, you know, we just kind of, and also, up the dots and those numbers the... are just based on us using the internal gross internal area of the building yeah no extensions yeah mm -hmm. normally we go in and we try and add value through adding square footage yeah great thing about this model is you could find a site that has a car park has a bit of a side has the ability to yeah. extend i appreciate that's all phase two that's hope value and that would then you, need planning obviously. and that would yeah. need planning yes but you could have you're, a model you're looking for the easy hanging fruit first the easy hanging fruit yeah. of course the, and by the way let me ask you a question, guys. Do you think that there might be lots of people who are doing exactly what these owners were doing? They're running it themselves as a lifestyle business. And although business is good now, do you think there might be people who really struggled during COVID and are still emotionally and maybe financially scarred from that and just want to get out? Who thinks there might be some of those around the country? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you might want to put in your action list. You might want to start looking for B&Bs. Yeah. And it's um, really learning about the C1 model and understanding how that works because... Yeah. Um, I say that they're everywhere, but it's understanding how to navigate them and how to absolutely. And then you know, coming back to the investor part. Yeah. Oh, so course. we Which... we so that was all funded by yes. investor loans. So yeah. it was on a loan basis. You know, we're yeah. the joint venture partners. So, yeah. um, so that was you know using it, it existing investors and stuff. And then actually, property number two, uh, hotel number two. Um, it doesn't have any bank finance on it at all. Yeah, nothing. Uh, the bank, no, they offered it to us. Oh, right, okay. I sat around. They had, we had breakfast with them, with a the bank manager, and they went offered us the money. Then we had to say we don't need it. Yeah. Well, it was we. They noticed those banks do that. They lend you money when you don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else noticed that? By the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were just kind of we were, we were looking at the the terms of the bank and with all the interest rates going up, mm. and um, and it was going to be a repayment. You know, so that's something mm. to take into account. A lot of these, you know, if you're going down the bank route with a kind of more commercial mm. uh, product like this, it's likely most banks are going to want to do it on a repayment basis, mm. which is fine and, and actually great for us because we're paying down some of the day on that asset. We've got other assets and stuff. But we were looking at, and we'd refinanced the, the first one with the bank and, and that's all great. Um, but the second one, we, you know, we, we were looking at the way, you know, the interest rates were going up and everything. And we're like, well, from a cash flow point of view, if we're paying that, the, the, the bank interest as it is now and the repayment element, that's well, going to eat, eat into our cash flow yeah. uh, quite a lot. So I said to Stuart, well, actually, why don't we just look at, instead of getting, um, instead of getting, using the bank, why don't we just see if we can mm. just get investor loans? Yeah. <laughs> well, say it. It. Say well, and, then, and then we did it in how long? You did it. You found a, 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 a couple of calls and we had 900 grand within about three days, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> And also one other a little interesting point. On their terms in the bank. One other, yeah. other interesting point um, is that a lot of the investors that we have in the apart hotels are not chasing the highest rate. It's not like a HMO investor that wants to come in on the development, no. give you some money, and then at the back and then the back end, they get their money back and then they want to go into the next one and they might have gaps between investments. These investors are happy to leave their money in on three to five years on a lower consistent rate. Mm. This business model is perfect for cash and SaaS investors at lower levels yeah yeah it's more attractive to them as well and especially uh, SaaS. well yeah and if you've got those relationships if you've built those relationships mm -hmm. over time you know investors are, are going to feel more comfortable working with someone that they know and trust mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, even if that, if even if it's on a slightly lower rate than they might be able to get elsewhere. Yeah. And also because we didn't use the bank finance, it means we we're able to give first charge to exactly. the investors. So that is uh, appealing to them. So it's not always, you know, bank. Yeah. It's not always the best thing to, to use a bank. Well, again, no. if you told me at the start that I could have got all of our investors down to the rates we've got now, I would never have believed you. No. But when I started my mastermind journey, obviously, as we all as we as we all do, we probably pay more rates than higher rate than we, yeah. we think. But it also comes with your experience, right? It comes you your have experience. experience that you know, and you've got yeah. better relationships as and well. You just you'd be surprised that you can get them at uh, some yeah. very good rates and uh, yeah. commit them for longer. So this this strategy is perfect for investors. I think it's like coming back to that thing though about like what you said of can you imagine if you were doing this right at the beginning. In. so when we were sitting here exactly you know in the same position as everyone here like um whenever it was like a few a few years ago is you know you you don't you 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 I wouldn't have ever imagined it and I wouldn't have ever imagined you know because you think well you, so some people go it's easy for you you've got all these investors and stuff but remember um, we didn't you know when yeah. we started out we didn't have all these investors it starts with your and, very and first deal and your very and first that's why investor. I wanted you here because you know you're, you're quite a long way down the journey obviously but I want to show people where they can get to what's possible. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Slow, organic growing of investors. Yeah. Natural, yeah. slow, organic. Yeah. Not doing it with people you don't know or you no. don't trust. So organic, that slow growth. Yeah. You've got to start. And it's early. over time, you yeah. know, and it's not about, it's that you don't try and fast forward to, yeah. to that point yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Just one, Brilliant. one day Brilliant. at a time. Guys, look, we, we, we've not got a huge amount of time, but I just I want to uh, give them a round of applause, guys, first of all. Amazing. And um, I'm sure we want to be a lot more. Sure. What we'll do, we'll sort out a date for a webinar. Yep. Uh, to talk more about apart hotels, we'll yep. we'll let you all know about that, guys. But we'll, we'll set that. We'll sort yep. that out soon. We'll let people know about that because I think I know you a lot more to to share about that. Yeah, and so, we can take everyone through the C1 model in a bit more detail yeah. so you understand how it works. That'd be awesome. Okay, but uh, but hopefully it's done the job in terms of showing people. Uh, a great example of a mega deal, showing people if you get good profitable mm -hmm. deals, you can use other people to fund them. Yep. I hope you really inspire people, make people a bit more aspirational. So thank you so much, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I do hope you got massive value from watching this YouTube video. I'd encourage you to click on the link below to come and do the online training with me. And I've got another video lined up for you, which I think is also gonna be really useful that you should watch once you've registered for the online training with me. So invest with knowledge, invest with skill. I'll see you very soon.